Hello, my mathematicians. Welcome back to another episode in the Quadratic Functions playlist. And if you want to learn more about Quadratic Functions, make sure to check out the link at the top of the description as well as the info box. There you can find the whole playlist. There's everything in there that you are ever, ever, ever going to need during your school life with respect to Quadratic Functions. We want to continue from where we left off last time. Namely, we were discussing functions of the form f of x being equal to ax squared plus b. Meaning what we did, we scaled up a parent function, so we made it thin or thick or maybe reflected in the downwards y direction and we shifted it upwards and downwards in the process with this parameter b right here. And I was hinting a tiny little bit towards the zeros of these functions last time because we could shift those functions up and down and we noticed that we could have one basically zero of this parabola. We could have no zeros at all or we could have exactly two zeros. And we want to go through all the cases today and discuss when all of this happens exactly and also how you can calculate those zeros for yourself pretty easily by solving a simple quadratic equation. So this right here is very easy to solve and we are going to do this at the end of the video. Now we are going to dive right in and start off with the first case. We are going to discuss six different cases today. I can, yes, six. Six. You can see we are going to discuss six cases today. Namely, we are going to start with a being greater than zero. Now, how do uh, how do parabolas look if a is greater than zero? I mean, they were opened in the upwards y direction, and this is the most important thing about all of this. Okay, the sign of a. Namely, if we draw a graph, we could have um, let's say something like this. Okay, let's say we could have the simple parent function x squared. Now, how many zeros do exist for um, this very function that we're having here? I mean, it runs exactly through 0, 0. Oh, so we have a 0 at x naught being equal to 0. Now, what about our b? How is our b defined in this very situation? I mean, our b right here is zero. We did not shift this function upwards or downwards in the least bit. Didn't happen. So the first case is for a greater than zero and b equal to zero. And how many zeros do we have? Well, we have exactly one root coming with this function. So we have a root at x naught being equal to zero. Now I want to be a bit more mathematically precise here because we actually have two zeros, but they both lie at x not being equal to zero. We are talking about a root with multiplicity of two. It's, it's a double zero, you could say. And this happens a lot with um, functions, even on higher de degrees, that you have um, a root being located at the same spot multiple times. This is basically what it means for a root to have a multiplicity and in our case too because both zeros, both real zeros lie at x not being equal to zero. Now what can be the next situation? I mean we talked about b being equal to zero. Why not say b greater than zero? Okay, if we have b greater than zero we are going to shift our parabola in the positive y direction. Oh. So how many zeros do we have now? I mean the visual representation of these problems actually comes in quite handy because you can see at a glance that for example for this situation a greater than zero and b greater than zero no roots do exist. I mean we do not cut through our x-axis at all. There are no real zeros which satisfy the equation ax squared plus b being equal to zero. Just doesn't happen. Meaning for a greater than zero and b greater than zero we are not going to have any roots at all. No real roots at least. Yeah, and this was basically already this case. So if you encounter, for example, a function f of x being equal to 2x squared plus 3, you know immediately that it's not going to have any zeros. If you want to calculate the zeros, ain't gonna happen. No real roots do exist. Now, what is the last case? I mean, b equal to 0, greater than 0. Oh, yeah, b being less than 0. Um, what do we have there? I mean, what happens if we have b being less than zero. I mean we're going to shift it in the downwards y direction, meaning we can have a function looking like this. Ah, and it's very clearly seeable that <laughs> we have two roots. Ah, this is cool, right? I mean there are two points where we cut through the x-axis and for this case where a is greater than zero and b strictly less than zero we are going to have exactly two roots. And the best thing about these roots is that um, since we are not shifting our parabola to the left or the right 
our y-axis is actually once again the symmetry axis. Meaning if we have a root lying at 3 right here, we know immediately that the other root is going to lie at negative 3, which comes in quite handy. So you don't even need to calculate too much. You already know by the symmetry that that is basically just a reflection okay, of the root on the left or the right hand side if you are given just one root and you need to find out what the other root is without any calculations at all. So we have exactly two roots. And we are going to discuss how to find those roots in a minute. So those were the first three cases and now off we go to the next three cases. Also I do not want to discuss what happens at a being equal to zero because then we would just have a constant function and this is just a special case that we talked about in the linear functions playlist already. So we're not going to talk about this. Now what about a being less than zero? What is going to happen there? So if a is strictly less than zero then what is going to happen? I mean it can be stretched or squished basically but the most important fact about a being less than zero is that that it's going to be opened in the downwards y direction. Meaning we can have a function like um, this, like the parent function just being opened in the downwards y direction. Okay, so once again, what is this case? I mean this right here is for a less than zero, but b being equal to zero. Okay, if it runs exactly through the origin, we are going to have basically just a parent function which is going to be thick or thin, stretched in some way. Okay, so for b being equal to zero, we are going to have the same situation again. The root, the one root or the root with multiplicity of two is going to lie exactly at the origin. Meaning once again, we are going to have a root at x naught being equal to zero. This is just very simple analysis and you can see it at a glance that this has to hold. I mean, it was the first chapter that we really talked about when talking about um, quadratic functions at all. And we discussed the roots there already. Now, what about b being greater than zero? Now you might think at first glance, well, for b greater than zero, well, we are not going to have any roots at all, but think a bit further. So we are going to shift our parabola in the positive y direction. Also, do not forget that we are going to have it open in the downwards y direction. Oh, this time it's completely the other way around. So, so at first we had a greater than zero and b less than zero. So inverse signs basically. We're going to get exactly two roots. Now it's basically the inverse thing that we are having. So a less than zero and b greater than zero is going to give us two roots yet again, which lie basically the same distance apart from the origin. They are once again just reflections of one another and we are going to have exactly two roots again. Isn't that cool? I mean um, it just has to do with the signs. So basically a monomic device is to just say if our a and b have inverse signs, so one is positive and the other negative or the other way around, we are going to have exactly two roots. And this monomic device actually comes in quite handy because you can see at a glance without any calculations at all how many roots you must have. And then you can start calculating after that. Before you do any calculation, always make sure to do a tiny little bit of analysis and try to understand the problem at all. Now, what about less situation? B being less than zero. Okay, what happened before? If A and B had the same signs, we didn't have any roots at all. Does this apply for this case too? I mean, we're going to take a parabola, which is open in the downwards y direction, and we're going to shift it downwards in negative y direction, meaning we can have a parabola like this. And yeah, well, once again, we do not have any real roots at all. It really doesn't happen if you think about it. I mean, we're not cutting through the x-axis at all. So once again, we are going to have no roots. This is interesting, right? Really cool. And, and even though we have six cases lying around here, this simple analysis is going to help you a lot. So if you just try to understand the problem visually, you're already pretty far into the calculation process because you know what you are going to go at. What do you want to calculate? Do you even need to calculate something? This is really helping you out and you should try to dig more into this topic because it's really going to make your life easier during exams for example. Now we found out all the cases and what about calculating the roots? I mean we only have to calculate the roots for two cases basically, namely this case and this case. We don't have to calculate for b being equal to zero because we know that the root with multiplicity 2 is going to lie at x not being equal to zero. But what about 
the other two cases. I mean, let us think back what it means for something to have a root. I mean, we are going to take our equation f of x and this is always going to be equal to some y coordinate, okay? But what is our y coordinate exactly when we are searching for the roots? I mean, by definition, a root is the place where our functions cut through the x-axis, meaning our y coordinate is being equal to zero. We are going to try to solve this equation and this is very easy solvable. At first, we are going to get rid of all the additive or subtractive stuff, meaning we are going to subtract b on both sides. Negative b, meaning we are going to be left with ax squared, since nothing but negative b. Now those two are basically composed using a multiplication, meaning to get rid of the a on the side we want to solve for x, we are going to divide both sides by a. Okay, then we are going to end up with x squared being equal to negative b divided by a. And what you need to do now at the very last is to take the square root on both sides to get rid of the square right here. Meaning by taking the square root we are going to get that our two roots x0, 1, 2 are going to be at positive or negative. You always need to take two branches of your square root. Because we are going to have two solutions, two roots, and they are going to lie the same distance apart from the origin on the x-axis, okay, just as another monomic device. So positive and negative square root of negative b divided by a. Uh, but Papa Flemmy, something's weird here. Why are you doing this? You are taking the square root of a negative number. This ain't working. Our teacher told us infinitely many times that you can take the square root of a negative number. Well, we do not do that, not in our two cases that we are having. Just imagine we are going to take a look at this case, a greater than zero and b less than zero. I mean, then we have something negative times negative divided by positive. Negative divided by positive is going to give you a negative number. And then negative times negative is going to give a positive number. So the discriminant, this is what we call the discriminant, is actually greater than zero, meaning we're going to take the square root of a positive number, which does work out. So same situ situation here. For this situation, a less than zero, we are going to get um, positive over negative is negative, negative times negative is positive yet again, does work. And this also explains why you are not going to get any real roots at all if you have, for example, this situation, a and b being greater than zero, both of them. Then b divided by a is positive, divided by positive is positive. A negative times positive is going to give you a negative number. Square root of a negative number doesn't exist in the real numbers. No real solution for that case. And this is what your teacher is talking about, okay? Don't be confused by taking the square root of a negative something here, because actually due to the cases that we discussed, the negative signs are actually going to cancel out. And hence, all of what we did here actually makes a lot of sense at all. So I hope you did enjoy this video. If you did, please like, subscribe, and comment, channel flag. Don't forget to check out the main channel, Flammy1, okay, just, just, just call Flammable Maths. <laughs> and yeah, check out the merch I create, etc. Now until the next video, I wish you guys a Flammable day. Stay safe, everyone. Ciao.